We are here to bring you another exciting interview. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce to you powerhouse behind Phase One Design, Kathy Ewan. Um, and Kathy has built an empire helping over 700 homeowners turn their visions into reality from construction sites to dream homes. Kathy's journey is a testament to passion and perseverance. So get cozy and get ready to be inspired as we dive into Kathy's world of design and creativity. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. We know you're a very busy entrepreneur and we appreciate you taking the time um, on a Saturday for us. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Justin, uh, good to see you. And yeah, thank you for having me on the show. I'm, I'm honored. Of course. So a few questions for you. Uh, what inspired you to transition from managing construction projects to designing dream homes? Well, the real story is uh, I was uh, 26 years old and, uh, you know, I was in project construction project management and uh, I saw a lot of issues, I guess, with, you know, I was on the construction side and I would have like worked always with drawings and the consultants on that side of things. And I saw a lot of things and, you know, I was like, hey, I'm wondering like why there's so many issues with ABC, you know, all these things. And I was like, hey, you know what? There has to be a better way to do it. And I was kind of very intrigued and curious to figure that out. Um, and I was 26 years old and, you know, kind of not very smart, maybe a little naive. And I I said to myself, well, you know what? I'm going to start a company and we are going to figure out a way to do it better. And uh, how I remember thinking to myself and saying out loud, I was like, how hard could possibly be to run a business? I'm going to do it. Wow, that's, that's really cool. I love it. I love it. Um, and could you share a memorable moment from your journey of founding Phase One Design? Um, it, you know, is there something that stands out in your mind as something that was kind of unique to your journey? Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, there's been like so many incredible moments and, uh, you know, and really we got to where we are today uh, with the amazing team that we have. And I, I still believe our success is really the secret sauce is our team really um but i remember when it was like literally just uh me drafting in like an office i used to live in okotoks and like literally just literally working around the clock trying to like juggle drafting and invoicing and you know, like all the business side of things and meeting with clients and trying to get clients and it was kind of like crazy so like looking back i'm like oh my god i'm so glad we're never we're not there anymore and um the dream was always to like build this incredible team that um you know they're just as passionate as i am about what we do and our cause in the world so yeah that's so cool i love it and you have a, a very compelling why so you know that's huge and I think you were the one who told me as well uh, that 2x is easier than 10x, and it looks like you're really. 10x. Uh, 10x is easier than 2x. 10x. Oh, sorry. 10x is better than. Go <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Well, I don't laughs> yeah. You have the numbers in there. Yeah, all good. Yeah, Benjamin Hardy. He's like one of uh, like one of the best books I've ever read, and yeah, it's true. That's amazing. I love it. Um, so how do you um, look at the key elements to making uh, a dream home truly exceptional? So really, there's no one-size-fits-all answer to that because every client is so different and every custom home and dream home is so different. So it really, um, I always say it really just boils down to three major things that like if you had to kind of dissect it. So the first thing is making sure that the space is functional. Uh, the second one is making it aesthetically beautiful. And uh, those two things are very subjective to each individual home and each individual client. So there's a process that we have to uncover what that
that and actually um, it goes to you know more members of our team that actually take it through the conceptualization stage and it gets into like an actual drawing format and then transforming that all the way through permits and you know construction drawings some more technical side so there's actually a lot of different skill sets that are involved in actually um, bringing a project to life. That's so cool. I love that. And and it's cool that you have a really defined system and process to make sure it gets there. Um, that's that's neat and cool to see. Thanks. How, yeah, of course. Uh, so how do you balance creativity with practicality when designing custom homes? Uh, great question. And they both need to be there. I think it really goes back to, you know, um, my earlier comment about like the three design elements that, in my opinion, if you're missing one of those three, the design is a failure, in my opinion. So it's really, um, it's kind of an art, to be honest, where where you have, and every project's different, so you always are going to have constraints, whether it's a site constraint or a budget constraint or something else, right, that you have to be practical. But then having the creativity to overlay on top of that and um, really come up with something spectacular. And what's really funny is, like, I'll share this with the world, is the more constrained your design is, the more I actually think it pushes us and our team as creatives to be more creative because you kind of have to think outside the box for a solution. So um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but yeah, that's a, you know, it's a fine balance. And yeah, you definitely need both of them in order to succeed. Excellent, excellent. And can you walk us uh, through the creative process when starting a new design? Um, so for instance, I know you talked to us about um, you know, listening to what your clients are looking for and sketching it out and that sort of thing. But when it comes to the creative side of it, do you look to certain sources for inspiration? Do you, you know, what, what do you normally do for that part of the process? Yeah, absolutely. So what's really cool about the custom world is we're literally designing something that's never been designed before. So a lot of the inspiration comes from really like talking with our clients and one of the, um, homework exercises that we always ask all of our clients to do at the end at the very beginning of the project and for anybody even here listening to this interview you can even just do this for fun uh you can actually just go out there and just gather a whole bunch of images in terms of what you actually like aesthetically and um so with with those images between that and all the other functionality requirements of the project um we actually we're, we're, that's kind of where the inspiration comes from, where we take all those pieces of information and pull them all together and come up with the actual design. So again, it's different for every single project, but I, I find too, talking to clients, sitting face to face with a client is very inspiring because you get to hear about their story, like their motivation, their why behind the project. And then you get to design something that is really really personal and meaningful to them so i'll give you an example like i feel like still um you know i've been doing this for 18 years now and still my favorite days are we call them presentation number ones where it's almost like the big reveal to a client where you know they see the design for the first time and like i'm always very mindful to like watch their faces <laughs> when we're showing them and it's there's like nothing more satisfying than to see like their faces light up and they're like oh my god I love the design so when you ask like what what inspires me like that moment to see that facial expression on one of our clients faces it's um it's like it's it's still awesome it doesn't lose its shininess after this amount of time that's so cool that's so cool and you're you're just um you can just see how much passion you have in your face it's so cool thank you yeah absolutely um, and so what role does sustainability play in your approach to residential design? The role would basically be, it always comes back to the client, right? Because everything we do is custom. So some clients are very, very um, uh, focused on the sustainability aspect and where some clients either don't know or like it's less important to them. I think one of our jobs as a design professional leading a client through is being able to show them options. So I think a lot of people do also think that sustainability has to be like way more expensive or like it's out of reach, where if you actually really understand the building science behind it, it actually doesn't have to be that complicated or that expensive, depending on what it is that you're looking to try to do, right? So for example, um, there's a way that you can actually build, let's say an exterior wall. For sure, it's it's an extra cost, but it's not crazy, crazy extra cost. But the amount of building comfort 
that you would actually gain by building your wall in that certain way is going to be significantly more than before, right? So most most clients wouldn't know that. So that is a part of the discovery process that we do with a client at the beginning of a project where we ask them, hey, have you thought of any of these sustainability um, initiatives? And if the answer is no, then we say, okay, would you like us to educate you on what your options are? And then that just really sparks a conversation that co can go a number of different ways. How do you stay inspired and innovative in an ever evolving industry? Uh, that's a really good question. So for me, I am a sponge when it comes to learning. So, you know, I'm always reading books in terms, like from a business standpoint, just to be like, okay, like, what else, what is out there that I don't know about? And I, for me, I also really like surrounding myself with other entrepreneurs in other industries and other fields, because you don't know what you don't know. And maybe like something that somebody else is doing in their business that's totally unrelated, you can actually take those learnings and, and apply it. And I just find just like surrounding yourself with, with other people that are, you know, operating at that same level in terms of like thinking, like outside the box, like it, it's inspiring in that way. Um, the other thing for me is travel, like, you know, and anytime you just kind of turn off your brain and go somewhere else, put yourself in a different environment, not only, you know, does it kind of free up brain power to uh, think about things in a different way, but you also see how other um, cultures, you know, have operate, like, and it could be something as simple as like, food, right? Or like, you know, in the context of architecture, it's it's so interesting to me, like every single time I travel, and it doesn't even have to be anywhere exotic, you're like you always see something different and you're like, well, oh, that's really cool. Like, why did they do it that way? Or, you know, like maybe you just get like a little snippet of an idea and it's like, oh, maybe I could use that on like this project that we're doing or whatever, right? So, and it's fun. Like, come on, everybody loves travel, right? So. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so cool. And, and so, in, in relation to design, uh, this is a, a question that we didn't plan for, so I'm just going to throw okay, it Okay, that's okay. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. Um, so, what was one of the last trips that you took, and what kind of inspiration did you take from that trip that you applied to a design? Ooh, that's a great question. Okay, that's a toss-up between, I would say, oh, Europe and Asia. So, okay, are you going to force me to pick one? Uh, you can do both if you want, for okay. sure. Well, I think, um, I, I think my learnings from, sorry, you were asking what, what was my takeaway from that? Yeah, and like what, what did you take from that travel experience and, and what were you able to apply to a design that you were working on? Yeah, so great question. Okay, I'm going to use Europe. So I think Europe for me, it was very fascinating to see these buildings that were long standing, like they, they were, you know, designed and constructed however many hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Like I, I traveled quite extensively throughout Europe. And uh, what was really fascinating for me was that not only were they still standing, they were still beautiful. So what I really loved about that is that there is a way to do design and architecture in a way that's timeless. Ooh, I love that. Right? Like, and it was really cool. Like, I'll give you an example. I was in Edinburgh. My brother lives in Edinburgh, or one of my brothers lives in Edinburgh. And uh, they have these, like, you know, I call them castles, right? Like, just these, these beautiful buildings. And they're everywhere. Like, you feel like you're, like, in the medieval times. But then you kind of look inside some of these that they renovate. And they're actually very modern, like on the inside. So there's this juxtaposition of this building that's like, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years old. And like, you know, and then something that's like crazy modern. And it's just done in a way that's so timeless and classy. I thought that was really cool. Cause you know, I think in Canada, and don't get me wrong, I was born and raised in Canada, so I love Canada. But I just feel like sometimes what we do, and I'm guilty of this as well, for, uh, we all are of our projects, right? Like we tear down houses and we build new. But it's like, okay, well, is there a different way to think about that, right? So, and I don't know the answer, but I mean, I was quite inspired by that. Wow, that's that's a really cool answer. I like that a lot. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, and, and I guess in regards to that as well too, uh, when it comes to design, right now we're in 2024, spring 2024. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is 
going to be the future of design in Calgary? Um, and so is it going to be those timeless um, type architecture or is it going to be something ultra modern like we saw a few years ago or mm -hmm. is this modern farmhouse or New York inspired brownstone going to continue? What do you what yeah. do you think is happening? That's a good question. Um, I hope that we are going to see more like timeless architecture, uh, which would be I mean, in my opinion, I think it would be great to see that for sure. Um, I think one of the trends, um, you know, we're definitely going to see, and, and not just in Calgary, I think like across Canada, is the trend towards more like multi family, you know, like row house, townhouse style units. Um, and what you see with those is, it, like, I'm not talking high rise towers, I'm talking, you know, spaces that are anywhere from call it like 800 square feet to maybe. 16 to 1700 square feet kind of like that right um where that those spaces don't really exist in that type of product right now um there's a lot of blanket rezoning as you know um, as everybody knows like controversial or not like it, it is happening um so i think we're gonna see a trend definitely towards smaller square footage and then also with that trend what i my hope is is that there's gonna be more innovative design out there right like we need to rethink spaces and how we live in spaces because you know and we've all been there right or lots of us have been there it's like everyone's used to living in 2500 square feet or 5000 square foot houses or whatever right but then you can still in my opinion i've lived in very small spaces i used to live in vancouver so you know living in a 568 square foot condo for three years like i know what that feels like and i actually think that you can do it very well if you design a property it literally comes back to design so it's just being thoughtful and intentional about designing in those small spaces and still making them amazing um, and not necessarily with extra cost and we're all going to have to figure out how to do that because that's the trend that design is going towards very 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 cool and i guess in in regards to the rezoning what, what do you foresee the landscape of redevelopment in the inner city to be with this new zoning, uh, et cetera, if you want to comment? Yeah, for sure, yeah. So, um, you know, obviously that was a very controversial topic around the world, or sorry, around, around Calgary, I should say. Uh, but, you know, the, the blanket rezoning is going to be something that is good in the sense that it's going to allow allow more density. However, there are, and the media doesn't really talk about it this, but there is mechanisms in the background where, for example, you can't, just because every single lot now, or a, a lot, the majority of lots, residential lots in Calgary are now zoned RCG. Yes, that's true. But what's also true is the administrative process in order to actually get a fourplex or a multifamily unit approved is you have to get something called the development permit. So development permit, the way that it now works is that, um, you know, it's, it's not an automatic approval. So there, it's it's a more comprehensive process than just like applying and being like, yep, automatically approved. And I won't get into the details because it's like so technical, put everyone asleep. But the point is, it's like not, it's not gonna be a case um, where it's just like, you're gonna wake up and tomorrow morning there's gonna be like four plexes and, and five plexes everywhere. I also do think that, um, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be a lot of development still with single family homes. Like it's, it's not that um, that type of housing need is gonna go away. So I personally, I do still think that there's going to be single family homes built, semi-detached, backyard suites, and just like, but now on top of those, you have this new kind of housing type that is being added to the market, which is for me, it's really fascinating. And obviously it's, it's no different than building um, one large custom home. If it's beautiful, it should fit into the neighborhood well. Same thing with the multifamily, right? If it's ugly and big and in your face, then you could say the same thing about a single family home too. So it really just boils back down to good intentional design. That's very, very interesting. Is there anything that uh, homeowners in specific communities should look out for? Um, you know, that maybe a fourplex or an eightplex or a row house is going to pop up beside them. Um, you know, are there certain certain contributing factors that make a lot a prime candidate for that type of, of build form? I think. Well, I mean, with a rezoning, you know, if you if your neighbor is zoned RCG then you can actually build that. So um, 
Yeah, and I mean, I would just encourage communication, right? Like, I mean, we've been working in inner city Calgary for 18 years now. And really, at the end of the day, you know, I will say, um, you know, just kind of as a general statement that when we're actually developing like a site, let's just say we're designing a multifamily unit, right? And if you're the neighbor and, um, you know, you want to participate in that design or like if you have, let's say, I don't know, a brand new fence that you just constructed or a tree that you just put like that you love and you don't want affected or sight line, like just knock on your neighbor's door and just have a conversation. Like I think um, I would, it would be true to say on behalf of everybody in the development industry that, you know, if there is a concern, we want to like have a direct conversation with that party um like early on in the stages rather than getting all the way through and then now all of a sudden everybody's like oh my god like what's happening and then at that point we're already done design we're done permits and it's like it's it's bad for everybody right it's bad for the neighbor it's bad for us because we didn't know about it so i really think just like everything in life communication is key so the, and the earlier you can have that the better i don't know if i'm answering your question justin but yeah no that's that's a great answer i like that can you share a project that was particularly challenging and how you overcame obstacles to achieve success with the project? Yeah, um, there was one project that we did in Port Moody, BC. Um, and it was like waterfront, it had a dock, but it, there was actually like a four story drop. It was like literally on a cliff <laughs> that we designed this house. And it was, it was wild. It was probably still up to date one of the craziest houses we've designed from a technical standpoint. Um, this, this answer is going to ring true for pretty much every project. So um, the key to success on that project was what we call an integrated design process. So having all relevant parties at the table, like at the very beginning of the project. So what I mean by that, it would be like we were there obviously to represent the design side. There was, uh, the builder was also at the initial discussions rather than like bringing on the builder later on. The structural engineer was there, the geotechnical engineer. There was like, you know, basically like a huge list of consultants um, and experts at the table at the very beginning um, with design. And normally that's something that we insist upon, especially with more complicated projects. Um, and something we always encourage is that collaboration. We know that you're you're um, quite philanthropic. Phil philanthropic. Philanthropic. <laughs> um, what do you enjoy most about being involved in community initiatives such as educational seminars and volunteering? Well, for me, one of my um, like big whys is like just leaving a positive impact in the world, and even like. I don't even think it needs to be that big, like even day, day to day, like every interaction you have with everyone, right? Like, like just trying to make that impact. Um, for me, I like to step outside of, you know, the world of what I do and like kind of like get back grounded. So even things like, I don't know, working at the mustard seed and like, you know, being exposed to that, that um, world. And, you know, I, I love that. So for me, it, it's, it's really about balance and, it, it really makes you grateful, right? Like sometimes I wake up, I, I think we all do this, but okay, I'll uh, admit, like sometimes I wake up, I'm like, oh man, like I'm really stressed out about a problem. And it's like, okay, well, you know what? Like that's 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 a good problem to have. The, the fact that I even have that problem, right? Like really just putting things into perspective. And I just always do like to give back, um, always, right? Like for me, legacy and impact is two of my like large core values that I live by. That's so cool. Uh, that brings me actually, uh, it's, it's a great segue into our last question. Finally, what legacy do you hope to leave behind through your contributions to the, to the design and custom home community? Ooh, that's a great question. That like gives me the goosebumps. <laughs> so I always say to my team, it, I know it's kind of morbid, but it's like, okay, so you really, you guys realize like every, all these projects we're doing, um, they're going to be long standing, like long after we're gone. Um, so you know, like your kids and your grandkids are gonna like drive by these projects and be like, oh yeah, you know, my granddad this, did this one or this one, this one, this one. So I really think like, you know, even like leaving a physical impact on the world, I think is really cool. Um, I also really, really believe in just like, like for me, um, you know, I have this dream of being able to create this amazing company um, that really, really just gives like amazing opportunities to be 
um, to, to, to like everybody that's on our team in terms of, you know, um, career growth, financial opportunities, and just, yeah, we have some pretty big plans. So I'm really, really excited to be able to get to that point where we can actually like even give more back to our team members than we already are. Um, yeah, so that's that's going to be my legacy, hopefully, because I don't have kids, so <laughs> it's my I big love, I love <laughs> that answer. That's so, so cool yeah. and so inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. So this brings us to the one word answer portion. And basically, we just want to get to know Kathy Yoon as a person. OK, awesome. Love it. <laughs> so, uh, what is your childhood nickname? Oh, cat. Like, cat. it's not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your dream destination. Oh, the moon. Ooh. I like that. <laughs> Cool. Uh, favorite uh, food cuisine? Anything new. What's your favorite comfort food? Chips. Ooh. <laughs> uh, spirit animal? A squirrel. <laughs> There's a story behind that I'll tell you offline. <laughs> okay, cool. I know. Sounds ridiculous, right? <laughs> <laughs> favorite movie? Ooh. Um, Pulp Fiction. Sweet. <laughs> uh, role model. Oh, I would say Benjamin Hardy. Cool, love it. Uh, favorite hobby? Right now, golf. Golf, sweet. Yeah. Uh, guilty pleasure. Chips. Chips. <laughs> Perfect. Chips and wine. Maybe sometimes at the same time. Nice. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Coffee all the way. Adventure or relaxation? Adventure. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Sweet or savory? Savory. Beach or mountains? Mountains. Fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Sunrise or sunset? Ooh, sunrise. Vintage or modern? Modern. <laughs> City life or countryside? City. Netflix binge or outdoor adventure? Outdoor adventure. Awesome.